How does your doctor pick your IVF protocol? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford, a board certified OBGYN and REI. So I'm a fertility doctor and welcome to the channel. This channel exists so that you can learn about your health, hormones, fertility, and be an advocate for your own body during your journey or really just your life. So today we're gonna dive in from insider info about how your doctor picks your IVF protocol what you should know and what you should be asking. Before we jump in, a couple quick updates and thoughts. Number one, thank you for being here. As you have seen, the As A Woman podcast after six years of recording content is finally on video and brought over here to YouTube. So please check out some of those episodes. There are long form content episodes ask questions on them and tell me what you want to see covered in a 30, 40 minute episode, what you want to see with a guest. It is engaging and really the production quality, I couldn't be happier. So I can't wait to see what you think. Also, I have very exciting news coming to you very soon. And you're going to know it first if you sign up for the newsletter. So the newsletter is nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. If you sign up for it, you will get my ultimate cycle guide, which is just going to tell you about your cycle and cycle tracking and cycle optimization. So that's just a little added bonus, but newsletter subscribers are going to get first dibs and updates on what is coming. So I want you to know that. So please head over to nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter so you can be in the know. I actually posted a teaser on Instagram and I was shocked at how the YouTube friends did not get what the big exciting news was, but Instagram was. So we need to connect more so you know what's coming. Let's dive into your IVF protocol. I'm gonna to try to say this as fast as possible, but I'm going to explain the key factors your doctor's using when choosing an IVF protocol so you can feel confident in the game plan. The protocol is the medications that we use to stimulate your ovary to grow the eggs. Remember that I like to imagine inside your ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept. At the start of your life, the vault is full. Throughout your life, eggs come out of the vault and eventually the vault will be empty and then you'll be in menopause but in every single month you have a group of eggs that all come out of the vault. Each egg is microscopic, but grows inside a small fluid filled structure called a follicle and the brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, which is well named to stimulate a follicle to grow. As that follicle grows, it's going to make estrogen, talk back to the brain, etc. Your body is wired to have one egg grow, everybody else die, next month a new group. But in IVF in its simplest form, I'm trying to get all of the eggs that we have to grow. So I am trying to override the normal brain ovary communication system so that I can achieve this outcome. And in order to do this, I honestly have to break them up and override. And this is why we have to use hormones or hormone blockers or modulators to change what would normally be happening. There is no one size fits all protocol. And I think it's a huge red flag if you're at a clinic that says, this is the only protocol we do, or this is the one that we always do. There are clinics who do the same protocol on every single patient. Of course, it is easier for their staffs, their nurses, everybody to make the same calendar. They will push you through, even if you have an outcome less than what you could get. And that is very suboptimal for you. That's not what's best for your experience. So I want you to know that if you hear those words, you should have a red flag. Not every clinic is created equal. And unfortunately, IVF has high stakes. It's expensive, both financially, emotionally, physically. So it's important that you know what to expect. When I'm choosing a protocol, things that I'm thinking about is what is going to be effective to override this communication. And a lot of this depends on how many eggs you have. Everybody's on a different trajectory of egg loss. And when your vault is more full, you have more eggs coming out every month. And when the vault gets emptier, you have fewer eggs. So I'm always thinking about your ovarian reserve, which means that I'm checking my own follicle count and having an AMH blood test. We want to use a different type of protocol if you could be at risk for overstimulation, if you have a really high egg count or high AMH. We, your ovaries are a little bit more stubborn if you have a lower AMH or a lower egg count. So definitely we have different things that we would want in those two categories. Your age does impact your egg quality. And so we might need a different amount of medication. We might need to consider how this protocol changes the environment when it comes to, is it a steady state? Does it fluctuate your hormones? Does it mitigate inflammation at all? Number three is going to be your diagnosis. Like, why are we doing IVF? I'm going to do something very different for PCOS, for low ovarian reserve, for endometriosis, for unexplained infertility. So what is getting us into this position? And does that make me want to use a different protocol or not? 
Number four is going to be a previous response. If you have done any fertility treatment in the past, it is key and essential that your fertility doctor has that information and not just the information that you have, but the information that the doctor has. So there's very specific charts from your monitoring with your follicle size, your medication doses, your estrogen levels, and then there's lab information, like how many of the eggs we retrieved, how many were mature and the ones that weren't, were they degenerating? Were they an M1? Were they a germinal vesicle? What stage of maturity were they at? How many fertilized? What type of fertilization happened? How many made it to embryo? Those that didn't, where did they stop in the stage of development? All of this information is pointing us to little clues. So I know it's really frustrating if you're going for a second opinion. We require all patients to give us prior records. And I know that takes time. You want to be seen. You feel like you're wasting time. It's the worst. But you want my advice or you want whoever you're seeing for that next opinion to be armed with your data. So make sure they really have what they need and always get it to them. It's a red flag if somebody's giving you a protocol and you've done a prior cycle and they haven't looked at it because then how are they personalizing it to you? I'm always choosing a protocol based on these factors for what I think you're going to respond the best. Again, my goal with the protocol is to get all the eggs to maturity at the same pace. Now, if I do that, that doesn't guarantee I'm going to have a baby or get to an embryo, but that is what I can do with what your ovarian reserve is and how many eggs you have that month. So we're gauging if we achieve that goal or if we need to make changes. The older we are and the fewer eggs we have, the more stubborn your ovaries are and the harder it might be to find this perfect combination. Meaning sometimes the kindest thing your clinic can do is cancel your cycle. If I think you could have eight antral follicles and you're going through IVF and you have three eggs growing, that is such a far departure from what we're hoping. We should at least have a conversation about does this make sense to continue or should we cancel which stinks, I know, and get another protocol though and see if a different combination of medications can achieve this job better. Overriding the brain's natural desire to just have one egg to grow, but not over suppressing it is a fine balance that sometimes does take trial and error. And I know that's frustrating, but we can usually do better after you've done it in the past. So in general, when I think about the protocol, this is my very quick explanation of what the different types are and what we're doing. I like to imagine normal ovulation like a nest of baby birds and mommy bird is bringing in one worm and that's your FSH. The biggest bird is gonna get the worm and grow to be the biggest and ovulate. Instead of that, I want all the birds to be really small and I want there to be no big bird. I really like them all to be really hungry together and that's starving the birds. So if there's no worms coming in or if I'm preventing FSH for coming in for a short amount of time and then I come in and dump a bucket of worms in the nest every day, now I'm feeding the birds at the same pace and they can all grow together and there is no big bird. So this is what we're trying to do with the protocols. We start protocols when you're suppressed and suppressed means a state of having hopefully no big bird. Some clinics do this off your cycle that's called a spontaneous start and we do this sometimes in the right patient but I do not find for the average person that this is very effective and we tend to get a lead follicle or cohorts of eggs. So things you can use ahead of time for suppression can include hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, the birth control pill. It can also include a medication called Lupron, which is a brain blocker to prevent FSH and LH from being sent out or an ovulation blocker, which is called an antagonist. These can all be used before you even start the meds to grow the eggs in a variety of different ways to suppress or hopefully get all those eggs to line up on the starting line or have a nest of small birds. The stimulation is what people think about when they think about IVF. These are your hormone shots that you take for about two weeks. They are mostly FSH. Now there's different doses of FSH. In some protocols, we have to use Menopure, which is a combination of FSH and LH. There's also add-ons. So sometimes cycles could include Clomid or Letrozole. These are trying to have your brain release some natural FSH. Some cycles use Lupron in a flare, the same idea, natural FSH, but then again, these are limited by what your brain has. And I often find that that could shortchange certain patients. And then there's things like human growth hormone, which can be used as an add on. So this is the stimulation and the stimulation phase is when we're getting the eggs to grow. And so this is when we are trying to take your hormone shots and you're coming in for monitoring and we're watching the eggs grow.
And then there's an ovulation blocker of some sort. And this is what the protocol is named after because estrogen triggers the brain to send out the LH surge. And if we don't block ovulation one way or the other, your body will naturally ovulate, which is not the goal with IVF. So an antagonist protocol is an ovulation blocker. This blocks GnRH in the brain. And so this is a common protocol for high responders and it can be used in some patients, maybe if they're doing a more minimal protocol, but it's more expensive and it's very specific on when you take it. Lupron can be used as a suppressant agent. It has to be started before your cycle begins or overlapping with birth control pills. And so that is one that Lupron lasts in your body for up to 12 days. Lupron works by telling the brain to send out all FSH and LH it has, and then there is no more. So then it is low, so you can't ovulate. And so this can be used and considered a long protocol, or you can use it for a period of time and then stop it, knowing that it lasts for 12 more days. And then there's variations of these where you change the amount or the length of Lupron, where you change when you have the ovulation blocker. There is also use of progesterone instead of an antagonist. So there's variations, but really kind of the two ideas are I'm either blocking ovulation after eggs have started to grow, or I'm preventing it from the get go. Now, you should always feel free to ask, like, why is this protocol chosen for me? This is more important if you've had a prior IVF cycle that didn't go the way that you wanted it to go. So you could say, hey, I call this a WTF appointment. Like, what happened? You could say, hey, this cycle wasn't great. You just want to know that your doctor's looking at that cycle and making a game plan with that in mind. There's no one answer. Your doctor's not going to say this is the right protocol because I don't know. I'm using all the information I have and my experience to choose the protocol that I think is the best for you. But if you're not responding how I want, I'm going to stop it. Or if you don't get the outcome we want, then we want to switch gears. I will say that, you know, I get asked a lot of questions about mild or mini IVF. And this is one of those things where you are purposefully using lower dose medication to get fewer eggs. Well, if you only have a few eggs, this might be appropriate. And those are circumstances where I do this, or if you have a ton of eggs and we're trying to get just a small group. But for the vast majority of patients that I see doing mini IVF or purposefully under stimulating you does not result in higher pregnancy or cost savings because I'm not utilizing your full egg potential and you're going to have to do more cycles to get there. So I think it's a really snazzy marketing technique that for a lot of patients sounds so good because we always want to use less meds or be more natural, but really always cautious about if that's being pushed on you why and really understand, oh, it's because maybe I only have three or four eggs, so I don't need all those meds and it makes sense. Or, oh, maybe I have 80 eggs, but I only need a few because of my age and my tubal factor. But really be careful of mini mild IVF. It might look good on paper. It might look good as a cost savings, but it isn't always that. So IVF is not always a one size fits all. Your protocol should be chosen based on your unique situation, your age, your lab test, your diagnosis. The goal is to get as many mature and healthy eggs as possible. So hopefully this helped you learn a little bit more about your body. Please feel free to ask questions in the comments. We're going to be happy to answer them. And as always, you can get more information on the As a Woman podcast. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter so you can be one of the first in the know at nataliecrawfordmd.com newsletter. Thank you, friends.